a kind of rest that the world couldn't ever offer. Rest that taps me in the back, reminding me that you are God, the God who loves me all the same, despite all sorrow and shame. Let my feet step into the solid ground, this sure foundation, a place where I can walk and rest and walk again, a place of grace. We choose to go to the moon was President John F. Kennedy's declaration the year before he died of the effort to land a rocket ship on the moon. So yes, the goal was accomplished. He said in this decade when he said it, 1962. The goal was accomplished posthumously. It literally skyrocketed all space exploration efforts. In 1964, the same decade, somewhere in the middle of the globe, in the continent of Africa, was a man in trial. His name is Nelson Mandela. And this he said, I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. This passionate, zealous speech of Nelson Mandela left the world tongue-tied and it changed, yes, the apartheid government, but in the same way, it left the whole world having a new mindset on slavery system. 1980, in another side of the world, the Filipino is worth dying for. Nino Aquino said that three years before he was assassinated. He said, is the Filipino worth suffering or even dying for? Is he not a coward who would readily yield to any colonizer, be he foreign or homegrown? I have carefully weighed the virtues and the faults of the Filipino, and I have come to the conclusion that he is worth dying for. That speech started our modern-day revolution, and it ended dictatorship years after. Last words. You know this, majority of you. Kaya John, magsumikap ka. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I understand. You were not born yet. But those very words of Doña Delaila gave you more to the Filipino household. Am I right? Words changes things. The words that I just exemplified, a few of them, changed the world. Today, we'll talk about words that change literally the world. You know, for some of us, or maybe majority of us, when you look into your Bibles, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a couple in Acts, you would see words that are in red font. We call it red letters. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. And that's what we are going to preach on this morning. In fact, I've placed a title to this message, Red Letter Resurrection. We'll look into a story. We'll continue from where Pastor Carlo left off 
last week. And then we'll check on the very words of our Lord and Savior. It changed the course of human history. Our hope, our prayer, and our faith is that it will change us today. It will clarify mindsets. It will adjust the way we live. Think of things. Open your Bibles to John 21, Red Letter Resurrection. One event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In John 21, it's one event, but there are two stories. So we'll talk about one event, two stories, and two biblical truths from those stories. A background first. I'll establish this, so give me time to do so. Again, one event, the resurrection of Christ. Two stories, we'll read it in a while, but allow me to just set the stage for that as we just look into the story, dive into it, and then get two biblical truths for today. Last week, Jesus said that he will meet the disciples in Galilee. He said that in Mark 14. Pastor Carlo mentioned it. He said, but I have, I, when I have risen, I will meet you in Galilee. We're picking up from that story. They were already in Galilee. Jesus went ahead of them. Before them, he meets them. That's John 21. Now, resurrection, you know, I was right there at the door welcoming the guy. Happy Easter, happy Easter. We normally say that, or for me, I prefer happy Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection, we understand that it is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It accomplished much. I, 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 this early morning, I, I posted in, in, uh, in my IG account that when Jesus died, He breathed His last, and that final breath gave us life once more. Life that was taken away by sin. It was supposed to be the life that God breathed into the nostrils of man in Genesis. But then again, it was taken away, taken, away, taken away by death, and then God restored that life. Now, when we say, yes, resurrection gave us life again, it is the proof of the work of Jesus Christ, rightfully so. But what we want to do this morning is to zero in into an aspect of resurrection. So it not, it's not just resurrection in general, but we'll focus the camera into this event called redemption. I know it's a theological word. word. Before, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it wasn't. In fact, it is a marketing word. It was used for business. When you say redemption, redemption is always both Old and New Testament, it's always associated. Yes, I know this is an event. It is a happening. But when taken from a biblical perspective, there's always a person involved. So when you speak of redemption, may taong kasama. I'll give you a I'll give you an example. When my wife and I sometimes we would passionately argue. Passionately argue. She would say this, ah, secret lang to. Sasabihin ng wife ko sa akin. Sabi niya, wag mo nga akong pastoren. <laughs> when you say that word pastor, you get the context, right? Sorry for the foreigners in the house. It's a Filipino thing. When my wife says that, wag mo akong pastoren, you know, that word pastorin, yes, it is an action by me, but it has a person attached to it, right? So similarly, when you say the word redemption, it's the same thing. There is always a person attached to it. Redemption, there is a person. It means to buy, to redeem, to purchase again. It also means to restore. It is a concept that the Bible is replete with. Again, as we, God created everything. We would always go back to that. Genesis. After God created everything, death ruined and destroyed 
humanity, the, the direction of humanity, the cosmos that God created, it, it, it swayed from its original intent. And so God set out a mission to redeem redemption, to redeem what sin and death destroyed, to redeem humanity and all of cosmos, and to restore everything the way God intended it to be. In the Old Testament, you would see, you know, part of the wonder of the Bible is that the authors, they, they wrote stories to record it as, as some of them had instructions from God. They were inspired by it. But it wasn't as if it was mechanical. It was like, hindi parang robot. No, they, they wrote something, God inspired it, and they were writing on current events in their time. Some accounts were a historical record, like chronicles. And they would recall the past and record it. But they were thinking of their current time. They were not even thinking of March 31, Philippines, Muntinlupa City, Victory Alabang. They were not thinking of you and I. They were just thinking of their situation, knowing that this writing will help them for whatever reason, various reasons, but they were not thinking of us today. Part of the wonder of the Bible is that even if they wrote it at that time, it also means another thing for us today. That's part of the inspiration of the Scripture. So when, when let's say, when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac on the mountains of Moriah, and then he did not do so because an angel stopped it. And then in the New Testament, Paul talks about it, and he says that Isaac was redeemed from the dead. Paul, in the New Testament, was just mentioning the story, but he wasn't even thinking of you and me today. Abraham or rather Moses, who without much argument wrote Genesis when he wrote that story. He wasn't thinking of us today. It was a record of the life of Abraham and Isaac, that specific event. But it spoke of redemption also. Because Isaac was already considered as dead. Remember the story of Joseph? wherein he was considered as dead by his brothers because they got so insecure with him and as a dead person, they sold him to Egypt from being a slave, from being in prison. Joseph was restored to his purpose and he became second in command in Egypt. There was redemption. Israel as a whole nation they were for 400 years under the slavery of Egypt. And then God took them out of that land. God said in Exodus, I have redeemed you. Exodus 6. We won't read it anymore. I redeemed you, meaning I purchased you. I was the one who rescued you. I'm restoring you to where I originally wanted you to be in in that land flowing with milk and honey under my lordship. So it is a restoration. In the New Testament, we see this work of redemption accomplished by Jesus. Well, we spoke about it last week, the, a bit of the life and then the death of Jesus Christ from the POV of Peter. And now we're in John 21 already. Meaning, yes, Jesus died. Jesus resurrected. He went to Galilee. And then John 21 happens. So we're there now in John 21. Before I ask you to stand, John 21. We'll read verse, starting with verse 1. It's, it's quite a lengthy passage. But in the last few verses of John 20, you will read this, John 20, verses 30 to 31. The gospel writer, you know, when you say gospel, it is the record of the 
good news of Jesus Christ or the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the gospel writer, towards the end of his writing, this is what he said. And truly, Jesus did many other signs. It's sort of like a conclusion already. John 20. Did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written <clears throat> that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may find life in His name. So it ends the record of the book, John 20. So why is there a John 21? John 21 is sort of like an epilogue. So meaning this is the record of the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. I'm ending the book. Here's the epilogue. This is what it means now that Jesus resurrected. And then he talks about two stories in John 21. And we're going to dive into two biblical truths. Why do we all stand? And we'll read John 21. I'll be reading from the ESV. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee or really it is a lake. And he revealed himself in this way. And then he mentions the disciples, the gospel writers, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathanael, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Now Peter said, to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. The fishermen caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is I, Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put, out, he put on rather his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Now the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in the place, with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus now said to them, come, have breakfast. They had a beach picnic. Tilapia, I'm not kidding. Kung ano yung klase nung isda doon, they call it now St. Peter's Fish, is exactly our tilapia. So, it was inihaw na tilapia, kaso hindi kanin. It was bread. Okay. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus, took, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time, third time, that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, the camera zooms in closer to Peter. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to, them, he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him again, 
Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus told him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, help us. Open our eyes, hearts, and minds to see you. Help us to understand you, that we may live our lives bringing glory to you, O God. Speak to us, God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your seats. Again, John 20, the gospel writer closes the book, and then an epilogue happens. It's, it means that he was speaking of the implications of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Specifically, what does redemption mean for us today? So what we'll do is we'll take it from the words of Jesus Christ, the lead, red, rather, the red letter fonts. But first, why is there a need for redemption? Well, we said it earlier, God created everything and it was very good. Sin, death, ruined and destroyed it. But what specifically in terms of Humanity, man and woman. It is a general thing to say, ah, the enemy, sin, death, ruined, destroyed what God originally intended. Suddenly, humanity deviated from God's original purpose. I do agree. But it's still a general description. What specifically was destroyed? So if about us, about humanity, man and woman, so what we can do is to look back at the creation of man and woman and see for ourselves what was ruined. So in Genesis 26, Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, God said, this is the part of the creation of humanity. Let us make man in our, can you say that? One word, image. According to our likeness, then he gave them a purpose. God gave them a purpose. Let them have dominion. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. God gave them a mission, purpose. God elaborated what his will for humanity was. So when humanity was created, man and woman was created in the image of God. What does that mean, image of God? We can take it from this passage. Man was to represent the dominion of God. In other words, humanity was to represent God over all of creation. God was the one in authority. He was the one who created everything. Therefore, he was in charge. What God did was to create man in his image so that mankind, humanity, will represent him. So the image of God, that's the one that was ruined and destroyed by sin and death. But it means, you know, humanity... God's image in us being destroyed, it meant, one, that we cannot represent God anymore because of sin, because of the death that happened. We, we were not, humanity was not the way 
God created them originally to be. So yes, the image of God that was destroyed meant that representation cannot happen. Second, God's purpose, it was hard to do. It was impossible to do because of the sin of humanity. In, 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 mankind was to take dominion over all of creation. But what happened was that humanity took advantage. Therefore, there was destruction of the earth. Ergo, we have our environmentalists today, right? So the original purpose of God cannot happen. Why? Because God's image in humanity was destroyed. God created humanity in His image so that we will reflect God to all, in all of the earth. Meant, this meant worship as well. That we are to worship God with what we do. With who we are, we are to worship God. Because of sin and death, it cannot happen anymore. And because of the consequence of sin and death, fellowship cannot happen. It destroyed it. There was a separation between God and man. Okay, going back to John 21. This is interesting. Because after the gospel writer closes the book, remember John 20, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. He sort of like ended it. And then John 21 happens. He speaks of the implications of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is where we get what redemption means for us in relation to what was lost, what was destroyed, what was ruined. And fascinatingly, we'll find it in John 21, in the words of Jesus Christ. First, Jesus said, children, do you have any fish? You know, Jesus was not fond of terms of endearment. You wouldn't see him tell the disciples, Hey bro, why don't you go with me? Brother, sis, do this for me. No. Read your Bible, you would see just Jesus telling the disciples, commanding them what to do. In one instance, he tells one of the disciples, you go to the city and then get a colt. It's tied somewhere. And when the master talks to you and says, what are you doing with my animal? Tell them, the master needs it. Inutusan niya lang bigla, di ba? Jesus is not fond of terms of endearment, but suddenly, he calls the disciples children. This blew their mind. In fact, possibly, this would have reminded them when Jesus spoke to a dead girl. It, it, you would know this. The, the, this was the daughter of this wealthy religious man called Jairus. When Jairus' daughter, you would see this in Luke, was dead, Jesus spoke to the dead girl and she said, Child, arise. Similar thought pattern. Children, I'm resurrected. You are resurrected with me. Do you have any fish? You know what was restored? Remember the four? Representation. It was representation. Because now finally, God calls His disciples children again. We were made in the image of God because of sin and death that was ruined, destroyed. But because of the resurrection, the redemption that Jesus did, we are all once more children of God. Amen. Hallelujah. If you, before, if resurrection did not happen, this would be your FB relationship status. Yeah. Eternally damned. If Jesus did not resurrect. 
last Friday, I was with a group of friends, really good friends of mine. We were having dinner. And there's this father, one of my good friends. He, he was talking about his son. And he was saying, oh, sabi ko, oh, magka-college na, anong gagawin? Ah, sabi niya, tinanong ko yung anak ko kung anong gusto niyang gawin. Sabi niya, gusto niyang ituloy yung negosyo ko. You know, when he said that, he was saying it with so much pride in a good way. It's like, wow, my son. And this was what his son told him. Gusto ko yung ginagawa mo. So when he said that, telling me that that was what his son told him, for me, it was, wow. You know, when a, when a child tells his father, I want to do what you're doing. And so now he's talking about the possible universities that he would enroll his son so that it's more than just education. It's the continuation of the business that he started. It's the same thing here. Children, it is now the continuation of what God has started. It means that because our status changed from eternally damned to eternal life, it means you and me can change. You know, today we live in a world that people want change. Ah, go. Can you imagine? Every election, every politician will say he wants change or she wants change. Lahat ng plataforma ng politiko is pagbabago. Have we realized na yung pagbabago na yan, hindi na nagbago? Panahon pa ni Bonifacio, pagbabago na. Ang iniiyak ng Pilipino. Hanggang ngayon, bawat politiko, hanggang sa barangay, ang sinasabi, pagbabago. Because we, our status has changed. Yes, we can want change, but we can change. A lot of people, you ask them, they want change. But who wants to change? Konti lang. Well, pag Kristiyano ka, pwede. When you are a Christian, when you believe in Jesus because our status has changed, there is hope. You can change. Whatever it is, what, what, your, your life possibly before Christ, you were doing these things, but now in Christ, you can change. Some of us may take immediately instant change. Some, it will take time. But the fact remains that in Christ, we can change. Jesus said, sabi niya, after niya sabihin, children, do you have any fish? Sabi niya, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Because initially, when we read the story, they were fishing all night. There was nothing. In fact, for those of us who have been reading the Bible, this sounds family, di ba? Nangyari na to eh. Look, makikita niyo to. Nando doon na to. Same thing happened. Jesus tells them, throw the net again. But wait, remember, these guys, they were in Galilee. Remember, Peter lived in Galilee. They were fishermen. Meaning it was their home court. I remember, Jesus was a carpenter, not a fisherman. These guys were fishermen. They knew the trade. They were experts in, is, in it. Their skill level in fishing, off the charts. No catch the whole night. Then suddenly, a carpenter, not a fisherman, tells them, cast the net on the right side of the boat. They did it, we read it, and there was a miracle harvest. What was Jesus telling them? Well, from a bigger perspective, but we won't dive into it anymore. Jesus was telling them, yeah, you were fishermen before, but now I am changing it. Remember when he called them initially? He said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of Men, not anymore fish. God 
because of the status change, God brought them back, redeemed their purpose. So it wasn't just representation, it was also redemption of purpose. God defined what they were to do. You will not be fishers of men. You did it, wala na kayong harvest. Now follow me. Cast the net on the right side of the road, meaning I will provide for you, but follow me. In fact, that was his words to Peter, remember? Those were his words originally to them when he called them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So, purpose. God redeemed their purpose. In the same way for you and me today, we are not defined by our achievements, by our aspirations, by our work, by the resources that we have. In fact, much of the stress, frustrations, and anxieties that we experience today has a lot to do with the constant search for the things that define us. An achievement, a possession, a goal, resources. Pag di natin nakuha, pag medyo lumalabo, stress comes in, frustration comes in, we worry. Here's the mindset now. Because our status has changed. We are God's children. Here's the mindset. I am God's child. What I have is enough. What I pursue is God's purpose. Can you say this again per line? One, two, three, go. I am God's child. What I have is, what I pursue is God's purpose. One more. I am God's child. What I have is, what I pursue is this can save us a lot of heartaches. I am a child of God. I will not worry. I will be provided for. I am a child of God. I will not be defined by the things that defines the world. I will not be shaped by the things that shape the world. I am the one who will shape the world based on God's purposes and will. This biblical mindset alleviates us with the weight and pressure of waiting for things that we do not have and the worry of things that might not possibly happen. Next, children, do you have any fish? Cast the net on the right side of the boat. Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you have caught. Bring some of the fish that you have caught. Now, this is a political sentence. When Jesus said this, it, it, it wasn't, we'll, later on we'll talk about it. He doesn't use this for the picnic. We'll read it in a while. But when he said this, this was politically charged. Remember, when we read, they were, Jesus was not far off. And he said it was about 100 yards, 90 meters so it's like from that wall, right unto the, hindi yung wall nitong pintuan, yung pinakadulong wall natin, bago yung furniture store. It was sort of like that. And Jesus can easily speak and shout at the disciples. He said, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. They would immediately hear it. And it was political, it was also cultural. I'll explain. Remember, these were fishermen and they were experts. In the Roman government, Rome it is so famous for the Roman roads, right? Literally, they built roads that connected everyone to Rome. Rome was well known for what you call Pax Romana, world history. Pax Romana, they maintained peace. Why? Because of their military might. Takot ang tao sa Roma. How does Rome, how is Rome able to do this? With money. They imposed 
a very heavy taxation system. They have a lot of tax collectors. Remember Zacchaeus, Matthew, they were tax collectors. Fishermen, pag nag, nasa laot sila, by the shore, nag-aabang ang mga tax collector. Di pa sila dumadaong pabalik, nag-aabang na ng tax. At saka nung lagay ang mga tax collector. When Jesus told them, bring some of the fish you just caught, the fish, tayo hindi natin alam. Peter, Nathaniel, two other disciples, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they knew what Jesus was asking. Jesus was like now this tax collector asking them for the harvest. But it wasn't to give loyalty to Rome. Because the moment they give that harvest, it meant from this point on, your loyalty belongs to me. Bring some of the fish that you just caught. What Jesus redeemed was worship. You bring your offering to me because I am your God, your Lord, and your Savior. Worship was restored and redeemed. Amen. Last, Jesus said, come and have breakfast. You know, if you read the account, even before Jesus said, bring some of the fish you just caught, if you read it, Jesus already had something cooked. May inihaw na tilapia at may tinapay na. And then he said, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Because, the, remember, it wasn't for food. It was for worship. And then Jesus said, Come, let's have breakfast. The resurrected Christ wanted to have breakfast with them. Culturally, having a meal, both in the Greek, Rome, and Hebrew culture is so Big. Pag in-invite ka sa bahay, kakaibang usapan yon. Parang hindi lang kayo close na ganito. Para kayong close na ganito at ginanun mo pa. Yun yung ibig sabihin nun. That's why when Jesus went to eat in the house of sinners, it blew the minds of the religious people. It was more than just food. It was about fellowship. You know, me and my wife, we have a relationship. We're married. But fellowship means na hininga ko pa lang, alam na nung asawa ko kung anong gusto kong sabihin. You know this for those of you married, right? Yung tingin mo pa lang, magsasalita ka pa lang, wala ka pang sinasabi, alam na ng asawa mo kung anong sasabihin mo. At nagre-react na siya, di ba? Why? Fellowship. This means that even today, yes, God knows us, but more than God knowing us, because He does know us, it's us knowing God. Even if He does not speak, even if we don't see God, we know Him. When there is a decision that we need to make, and there is a choice because we have fellowship with God through His Word, in prayer, through the, the relationship amongst the believers, it strengthens our fellowship with God. Because of that, we would know what God's will is. Because fellowship was restored because of the resurrection. So what did Jesus redeem? Very simple. It's the image of God. Representation. Purpose. Fellowship and worship. Why do you bow down here? We're, we're ending with one story, but I feel like we need to pray first. And then we'll continue the others, with the other story. Everyone's head bowed down and eyes closed. 
if you feel sin has gotten the best of you. And you're saying, Jesus, I surrender my sin to you. If you have made decisions that do not worship God, if you are living a life that does not represent God, if that is you, I just want to pray for you. Can you just raise your hand? Raise your hand right now. Keep it raised. Raise it up high. Raise it up. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Just keep your hands raised. I'm about to pray. If you want to say, if maybe you're not raising your hand yet and you're saying, I want to live a life that represents Jesus Christ now from this point on. If that is you, could you raise your hand? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All those raising their hands, raise your hands up high and just declare in your heart, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Lord, I pray for all these men and women raising their hands. Lord, it's, to a degree, it's, oh, it's quite embarrassing to be raising our hands now. But God, we know that it is your spirit that has compelled them to do this. Lord, I thank you that there is repentance in their ways. God, I thank you that there is forgiveness on the cross. That you have forgiven them of their sins. And God, I pray that it is not just only forgiveness. God, I pray that they would live lives of purpose, representing you, bringing glory to you in everything they think of, they say, and they do. God, I pray that everything will be a worship unto you from the mundane things to the big life decisions that they will make. God, I pray that they would have this fellowship with you, God, that they would know you, our God, our Lord, our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We said, one event, resurrection, two stories. Second story is quite quick. We read it already. From many disciples, you know, the Gospel of John, the, the structure of it is that Jesus... Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, first half of John speaks of the miracles. So Jesus will be engaging and He would be living. You, you see His life with many people. After the half, literally John 11, after the last miracle that John, the gospel writer, featured, which is the resurrection of Lazarus, you will notice by John 12, 13, leading up to this, paliit na ng paliit yung sinusulat na kausap ni Jesus Christ. Ito, the first story was about a few disciples. And then John ends the book by focusing on one disciple, Peter. Remember last week, how many times Peter betrayed Jesus? There was redemption. Jesus asked Peter three times also. One question for every betrayal. It was like Jesus telling Peter, Peter, I am giving you this chance now. You see me now. You saw the harvest. I am alive. Nag-picnic tayo, pinakain kita ng tilapia, pare. I am giving you. You can do this, Peter. You know, I can just, this is just my imagination. Jesus was routing, rooting for Peter. And he was, oh my goodness, this is Peter's chance. I am giving him a second chance and I know he can do it. So I will, I will ask the first question now. Peter, do you love me? And then Peter suddenly replied, yes. You know, in my mind, Jesus was saying, Yes. Go, Peter! Three-point shot, Peter! Then he tells Peter, Okay, this is what I want you to do. You tend my or feed my lambs. And then he asks, Second time, three times betrayal, Peter, do you love me? Sure ka ba? And in my mind, maybe Jesus was saying, I'm sabi mo, sure ka! And then Peter answers 
Yes, you know that I love you. And then he tells him, Okay, you love me now. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Twice. Redemption. But Peter betrayed him three times. So this was the final one. Ito na yung last. Ito na yung, whoo! Malinis na record ni Peter. Ito na yung bubura. Ito na yung ultimate redemption for Peter. So Jesus, in my mind, this is just my imagination, reading our Bible. Jesus maybe in his heart was saying, Oh my goodness, Peter, this is it. This is my last question. I know you will get it right, Peter. So I'm going to ask this. I am excited to hear your answer because you answered me right twice already, Peter. Peter, do you love me more than this? And then Peter resoundingly answered, You know, Lord, that I love you. And then he said, Feed my lambs. Peter was restored finally. What was restored with Peter? Yes, his relationship, his fellowship, but also his calling. It's the same way for you and me. You are not doing the things that you do because you need to earn money. No! You are more than that because you are a child of God. God will naturally provide for you. That is not even a concern for us. We should be concerned with what God has called us to do. Right now, with what He has given you, wherever He has placed you, with whomever He has placed you with. What is God wanting you to do? In that family now. In, in that neighborhood. In that business that you have. In that household that you manage. Or in the corporation that you are in. What is God's calling for you? Because that was restored. You are not where you are because you just need to earn money. You are not in that playing field because you will be provided for. And yes, God will use your work, your business, and whatever it is that you may have right now, but you shouldn't worry about finances. Yes, we will pray for it. And yes, we will continue to work hard. But we need to think of calling. We need to think of purpose. Last story, I was talking to a very young couple, toddlers, dalawa anak. They, wow, in the next few days, they will be leaving for Canada. And we were praying for them in our small group. But I just said one thing to the family, to the parent, to the couple. I said, I know you're going to Canada, you know, just like any other Filipino who has this dream of greener pastures. So yeah, God suddenly placed everything, you know, in its place and things worked out. So yeah, possibly this is God's will, but I need you to remember something. Canada is not the blessing to you. And of course, the normal route would be, ah, hindi. Oh, naman, di ba? Si God ang magbibless. No, no, no. I'm not going that route. No. Canada is not the blessing to you. You are going to Canada because you will be a blessing to Canada. That's the right mindset. Amen? Your company is not the one blessing you. You are the blessing to that company. So go and do God's purpose. When you do, provision will just follow you. Amen? Calling. Calling. Let's all stand right now. Lord, we thank you that you resurrected. Lord, you gave us example with your life, death, resurrection, and you've redeemed our status, our worship, our purpose, God. Now we can have fellowship with you, and God, you redeemed our calling. 
The enemy wanted it for its purpose. But God, now, because we are your children, Lord, everything we do will be for your greater glory. Can you just pray that prayer that, God, whatever I do now, it will be because you called me to do it and it will be for your glory. In your own words, just pray that. All right. We're about to worship. Does this mean di ka na magkaka problema? No, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. Magkaka problema ka, but every problem has a purpose. You will see it differently. So yes, you will. You know, at times, parang Lord, ano ba to? And you will be anxious, maybe. No, 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 no. Yeah, you just pray and tell God, 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 give me peace. With every testing you go through, there is always a testimony, as they say, right? So yes, we will not live on a bed of roses. We still live in a foreign world. Foreign world. world. Fallen, rather, sorry. We live in a fallen world. Sin of others will still affect you. But you have a different mindset. You are a child of God. You will deal with whatever challenge that the world will throw at you thinking that I'm already victorious over this. Why? Because Jesus won the victory. He has resurrected. Victory is won in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's worship God. By His stripes By his nail pierced hands were free. By his blood we're washed clean. Now we have the victory. Here we go. The power of sin is broken. Jesus overcame it all. Won our freedom. He has won our freedom. Jesus has won it all. Hallelujah. We say, Hallelujah. You have won.
are the risen King. I'm about to send you to a world that watches your life. So make sure to represent our God. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Church, you are now sent. God bless you all. Focused on your promise But still I see the giants In the midst of chaos I will look through eyes of faith Even when the war's rich I know it's not my battle Your spirit goes before me So every enemy must